This podcast was previously called Sunny Bitcoin. We are changing the name to 21 Towers and it's my privilege that Dhilin Alden is the first guest on the brand new 21 Towers podcast. Hi Lynn, thanks for coming on 21 Towers. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Lynn, to most Bitcoiners, you don't need an introduction and like many of them, I've been following your awesome research that you come out with on macroeconomics and Bitcoin. It's not a surprise that you have a huge Twitter following of more than half a million followers. But for my listeners, tell us a little bit about your background and how you started your investment advisory services, Lynn Alden Investment Strategy. Yeah, so my background is a blend of engineering and finance uh, and, and mostly in parallel, right? So, you know, when I was a kid, I was an avid investor. Uh, but when it came time to go to university, I had to choose between kind of my interest in science versus my interest in, in finance. And I went the more engineering and science type route. So I, I got a degree in electrical engineering. And then I, I pursued a career working in um, aviation simulation, right? So I, I started out as a de- design engineer. And then over time, I got a master's in engineering management, focusing on financial modeling and engineering economics. I started to, to run the finances of that facility, became the head engineer. And so I kind of, you know, shifted from design engineering to kind of the business side of engineering uh, and the financial side of engineering and, and kind of like making the higher level technical decisions, things like that. And on the, on the side, uh, throughout that whole process, I was still interested in, in investing and it was still just a hobby of mine that I did. And, you know, back then blogs were a big thing. And so I, w- I would blog about some of my stock analysis and thousands of people actually read it. Uh, it was it was like a you know just a small anonymous blog on the side, and eventually I I, I did that for long enough, and I had enough of a, a view on things, and I wanted to start incorporating macro and doing it at, at a more professional level. And so in, in late 2016, I launched Lynn Alden Investment Strategy, that that you know focuses on the way I describe it is institutional level research, but in plain English. So the benefit of that is that institutional investors uh, like it as well as uh, sophisticated retail audiences um, uh, like it as well, because it's it's kind of covering things that it can be somewhat complex, but then, you know, trying to minimize jargon as much as possible and kind of use, use analogies and, and kind of plain English to describe some of the things that are happening. And so now I focus on that full time. And I also, I mean, along the way, I mean, if you, I guess the, I, I covered Bitcoin a number of times, and I eventually turned bullish in the bear market after, um, you know, the resolution of the block size war, basically that 2019, 2020 period. Uh, I started to get pretty bullish on on Bitcoin. I started, I started incorporating more of that uh, into my analysis, in addition to my equity and commodities and macro analysis. And since then, uh, I'm also, I'm on the, you know, I'm the board of uh, Swan Bitcoin. And I, I work with Ego Death Capital, which is a B, Bitcoin only a, a VC firm, where we, you know, we we, we do seed level uh, types of investments to to find companies that are building interesting things on the Bitcoin network. Uh, and so it, it it's something that the way I describe it is I, I spent a long time kind of identifying all the ways that money was broken, and eventually I, I found something that I, I felt was a constructive way to address some of it, which is Bitcoin. As soon as you started writing about Bitcoin, I think you absolutely shot to fame within the Bitcoin community in a really short time. And and Corey, uh, you mentioned Swan, you're on the board of Swan. Corey is also a, a part of the YPO community of which I'm a member of as well. And, you know, he's really active. Um, so that's that, that's amazing. I think, I think you're becoming more and more of a Bitcoiner. And I think it fits in really well. If you're already involved in macroeconomics, what are the different types of advisory services you offer? And are there any free and paid versions? Yeah, so I, I do a lot of free work, right? So I do public articles, public newsletters, things like that. That's where a lot of people know me from. I also have a low-cost research service that, uh, kind of like my prior description, both institutional level and you know sophisticated retail people sign up to uh, at purpose to keep it low cost so it's accessible to people around the world. Uh, and then I do I do occasional you know one on one consulting and advisory work in addition to my my other commitments. Uh, I, I have to unfortunately keep that to a minimum just due to time constraints. But I occasionally will talk to investment banks or you know pensions and and just you know kind of larger pools of capital that that might be interested in in you know, talking about a couple like uh, niche things that are happening in macro. 
And what, you did mention uh, the audience for your advisory services, but what's what's the target audience for for these products and services that you offer? Yeah, so a big spectrum. Uh, that's what makes my my offering kind of unique. Is that you know a lot of um, research uh, is either targeted specifically at institutional or targeted at retail, and my goal is to is both. So I mean, I have you know multi-billion dollar capital managers uh, that they read my material uh, and, and subscribe to my services, as well as, you know, an engineer that, that works and wants to figure out where to invest her money or uh, a lawyer, for example, or a doctor, or, you know, just, just regular people out there that, that have some money that they want to invest. And, you know, they like reading, you know, somewhat complex material, but, but, you know, not, not something that's overly complex because it's not their main profession. So I, I try to write in such a way that there's that, that broad segment. The one, the one area I don't really go to is that kind of more sensationalized, like, you know, that the, the retail to retail audience of, of things like that. I, I, I focus on either the, the, the more sophisticated end of retail, as well as more professional types of money managers. What do you think the Fed will do today? Any comments? Well, the, I think the market's probably right that they're probably going to do 75 basis points. Uh, and I think the, the key thing the market's going to be watching for is what, what is the language around the eventual pace of, of tightening, right? So they've been doing these 75 basis point hikes. And I think the market is going to be looking at, are they hinting at a 50 basis point move, uh, either the next meeting or the meeting thereafter? And so that kind of how hawkish or, or dovish Powell sounds, I, I think is really going to be the key question the market's focusing on. I don't have a strong answer between those two. Um, I want to talk about some of the points that you opined in your last newsletter for the October one. And I think you, correct me if I'm wrong, but you did, did you come to the conclusion or it's your opinion that the dollar has already, you know, topped and a Fed pivot is around the corner? Is that the kind of conclusion that you were coming to in your newsletter in the last one? Not quite. The way I would phrase it is that, so we've had this really sharp move up in the dollar and some of those factors are still there, but a lot of things happen in macro around the margin. They happen in rate of change terms. Um, and so I, I think what's what we're getting close to is that the Fed is kind of hitting peak hawkishness in rate of change terms, meaning the speed with which they're increasing rates, not not the highest absolute level that they're going to get to before this is done. In addition, there's different components. There's the rate component, but then there's also basically the quantity component. What's happening with you know QE versus QT? What's happening with say SLR adjustments, which are, which are basically you know regulations that affect how much treasuries banks can buy, uh, for example. Or what's happening, you know, outside of the Fed, what's happening with, with Treasury market and, you know, the Treasury general account and potentially doing like, you know, buybacks of Treasuries uh, to try to address some of the liquidity issues. And so I think we can segment things into a couple uh, different buckets. And I think that in rate of change terms, they might be getting, you know, at that kind of peak level. And so I, I think we have to start watching the dollar to see if that keeps screaming higher, if that starts to get a little heavy. In this environment, because, you know, most of the dollar index is weighted by the euro, and that's obviously, you know, facing energy crises, which, which you know, have a couple different directions that can go in over the next couple of years, um, as well as, you know, the, you know, you have the yen, and they're doing, you know, for, formal yield curve control at a very low level, which is kind of like, you know, purposely devaluing their currency. So I, I generally am looking at things more of a currency by currency basis rather than that big bucket analysis. So I think that the, the bucket analysis is still something useful to look at for sentiment and overbought and, and kind of, you know, rate of change terms. But I think that where things will matter is on the margins. What's happening with, say, the dollar versus Brazil's currency or the dollar versus India's currency or the dollar versus China's currency, um, you know, specific currencies. Uh, and so I, I think that in general, the ones with, with less debt and, and a less acute energy situation are you know better positioned here going forward but i think that i think i think the speed of the dollar index move we've seen so far is probably behind us and you've also mentioned in the uh, in, in your newsletter that the fed would need to buy treasury bonds despite high inflation much like the bank of england just had to do is that an example of a pivot in your opinion well, if they have to do that, yes. Uh, I think eventually the question is how long can they push? So the problem right now, you know, if you look around the world, kind of the 
the end game for this type of, of scenario, like at the end, I, you know, what Ray Dalio would call a long-term debt cycle, where you have very, very high sovereign debt level, and then you eventually run into high inflation, uh, usually due to a, a commodity bull market, uh, just from underinvestment in CapEx. Plus, these things feed on themselves. So inflation and populism can lead to war, and that's more inflationary and, and, and drives more populism. And so these things become vicious cycles. Uh, we also have a, some degree of deglobalization happening, or at least globalization slowing down you know it, it's not kind of you know jobs not pouring out to say china for example the way they were now you have that more of that geopolitical uh distancing uh happening as well as of course the you know cheap russian gas going to europe uh is is you know somewhat of a thing on the past so we've had these these elements that kind of shift the prior playbook and you know in this type of snare if, it, you have to go back to kind of the 1940s to find a similar environment which was you know, sovereign countries, you know, major developed countries with very, very high sovereign debt levels, and then they run into inflation. And the question is, how do they handle that? And normally the way they handle that is by, you know, printing despite the fact that inflation is high. So, for example, if you look at Japan, they're, you know, they're doing yield curve control, which means that they're willing to print new money to buy bonds to hold their yield down, even though inflation is currently above their target. Uh, it's not as bad as some parts of the world, but you know it's above their target, and they're still printing money into it. You can also look at Europe, where they're doing spread control. You know they have Italy with 150% debt to GDP, and you know not a lot of for not a lot of demand for their bonds at these rates. And if they get to rates that are actually kind of make sense, that that kind of causes a fiscal spiral for the country. So you have uh, you know Europe, uh, you know European Central Bank selling German bonds buying Italian bonds to try to manage those spreads, that's another version of essentially printing into high inflation. Uh, it's just less extreme than what Japan's doing. Then you had the UK where you know they had 10% inflation and they had to do a multi-week period of unlimited QE uh, when they were planning on doing QT to address the fact that you know most of the large pools of capital had to suddenly sell a lot of bonds due to leverage and, and other things like that. And the United States is better off than some of those but we are seeing a lot of dysfunction in the treasury market. And part of the reason is when the dollar gets very strong, the foreign sector generally stops buying treasuries in aggregate. And it's because they're, you know, the whole point, the, the main reason why, say, foreign central banks hold treasuries is so they can sell them if they need to defend their currency at some point in the future. And so, you know, it's kind of like an egg, uh, a squirrel living off of the nuts that it collected all through the summer and the autumn. In the winter, it has to eat them. And it's kind of like that now. Now that you have this really strong dollar environment, those treasuries and all these different foreign pools of capital generally represent stored up acorns, nuts that they can sell if they want to backstop their currency. So, for example, Japan is selling you know, some of its foreign exchange reserves in order to, to slow the descent of the yen. Uh, we've also seen China reducing its, its treasury holdings. And so we kind of have an issue where the Fed's not buying treasuries, the foreign sector's not buying treasuries. U.S. banks, uh, due to SLR regulations, are not really buying treasuries, and so you know a lot of that has to come down to the domestic, you know, the domestic money manager or the retiree or the pension or the insurance company, and those are not as big ba uh, balance sheets as those sellers. So I think eventually they're going to get to a point where they have to do some sort of liquidity program, and that could be while inflation is is still hot, or it maybe it's maybe it's a second inflationary cycle. I don't think these things will be linear, uh, but I think that. Generally, the the end game of a very very indebted sovereign um, country is that they have to do often basically QE type of activities, even when inflation is above target, just to support the bond market. And when you're looking at the treasury market, do you have any comments on the time period when you expect a Bank of England kind of a uh, you know specific involvement of the U.S. Fed in the treasury market to happen? So 2023, it's gonna be. I think it's gonna be challenging to get through 2023 without having to do some liquidity provision, uh, unless the dollar tops, right? Because it, this is kind of an if-or uh, situation. So if the dollar keeps screaming higher, then that that response probably has to come earlier, because then the foreign sector is probably going to keep trimming their holdings, uh, and the economy is going to keep slowing down. And so that that you know whatever that date is, it pulls it forward. On the other hand, if, say, they, they hint toward, okay, 75 basis points, and then we're going to slow it down to 50, and then we're going to be data dependent, and, you know, they kind of, you know, not a pivot yet, but more like a dovish language pivot. If they start to kind of do that, if you start to get a, a local top in the dollar index, if Europe continues to have a very warm winter, 
um, and therefore get some of its energy crises under control. Maybe the euro stabilizes to some degree. If you get that sort of dollar, at least local top, that pushes back the date where the Treasury or the Fed might have to do some sort of intervention in the Treasury market because that allows foreign buyers to either stop selling or potentially come back and, and buy around the margins. Um, so I think that it's those two variables kind of together that you have to watch. Uh, but overall, I think that, you know, it's going to be challenging to stick to their full QT plan, you know, going all through next year with, with say, deficits where they are and with foreign buying currently where it is. Something we have to change. And until that pivot, you've kind of mentioned, again, these are words from your, from your newsletter, there continues to be a good case for defensive portfolio positioning. Can you elaborate what you mean by defensive portfolio positioning? Yeah, so I think what I've seen from a lot of investors is they're always trying to guess, like, you know, when the pivot's going to happen, when's this going to happen? And I think, you know, trying to guess in advance, I mean, there's certain things you can watch for. There's certain things you know that are, say, inevitable to happen, but you don't know when, or things that you know what to watch for because you think you know where the weakest link is, what's going to break first, for example. I think those that's useful information to know, but it ultimately comes down to it's a very complex system and you can't know ahead of time. And it's also human decision based. There's humans making decisions in the loop that you can't necessarily predict. Uh, and so rather than trying to constantly guess, you know, you know, where is this going to top out or what's going to happen there? It's saying, okay, it's, you know, until we start to see actual changes in say economic acceleration versus decelerating. So if you look at the, the purchasing managers index, for example, it looks like a sine wave generally every three years. You have a decelerating economy and an accelerating economy. Some of those decelerations can turn into recessions. Other ones don't, uh, usually because of some sort of monetary intervention. Um, but anyway, right now we're in a decelerating environment. Uh, in addition to the Fed being, you know, uh, doing quantitative tightening, raising rates, th this generally is a pretty toxic combination for risk assets. And so, you know, since since the start of the year, I've been kind of emphasizing things like healthcare stocks, things like uh, energy pipelines in North America. A lot of them already went through these big deleveraging periods. And so a lot of them are now cheap and less levered and lower payout ratios and quite attractive. You know, cash equivalents, uh, some gold, which, which you know, it hasn't had a great year, but it held up better than long duration bonds. Uh, that's for sure. Um, as well as there's been surprising strength out of, say, Brazilian equities, Mexican equities. Um, you know, there, there are these pockets of strength I think you can, you can, you know, go into if you want to take some degree of risk uh, that is maybe outside of the traditional defensive asset type of mix. And so I, I think while we're in this economic decelerating environment uh, with a tightening Fed, I, I think an overall defensive view makes a lot of sense. And after that pivot, we still need to be careful about which assets to own. After that pivot, what do you think would change uh, in our, you know, in your portfolio that you would advise? So I, I think for me, what I would generally do is lean into some of the things I already own that that I, you know, consider on that 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 more volatile side of the barbell. I think Bitcoin is is would be one of the the major beneficiaries. If you, you know, a lot of people call Bitcoin an inflation hedge. But it's actually, if you look, and, and obviously that, you know, that narrative was challenged this year because you have CPIs, you know, soaring and you have Bitcoin uh, in a major correction. Whereas the actual way to look at it is it's a hedge against monetary inflation. So, if, for example, if you look at global M2, which is global broad money supply, and then you denominate it in dollars. Uh, so what is the dollar value of all of those different major currency broad money supply? Uh, Bitcoin maps onto that almost perfectly. And so this year, that's actually been kind of flat to down in rate of change terms because, one, you have a number of central banks trying to tighten uh, their, their broad money supply growth. And then, two, the dollar is strengthening so much that when you translate all that back into dollars, it, it's going down. And so if you – basically, we, we've been in, you know, by that metric, it's not been inflationary. The inflation happened. The monetary inflation already happened. And now we're getting a trickle through into prices. And Bitcoin is more – corresponding to that. So if you do start to get at some point a, you know, a, a peak in Fed hawkishness, and then you also start to get an economic reacceleration, that's when I think, you know, you probably would see a reversal in that contraction of global M2 as price in dollars. And therefore, I think you would see, you know, potentially the resolution of Bitcoin's bear market. Um, so I think that's, that's something I'd look into. 
I also think that some emerging markets are going to be strong plays this decade. Uh, I think this is going to be a commodity decade. I think it's going to be an emerging market decade. But I would be selective on which emerging markets I, I focus on. I think I think Brazil's well positioned. I think Mexico is pretty well positioned. I think India is pretty well positioned. Uh, you know, I think I think there are a number of countries out there that you can have some exposure to. You know, currently, if you look at global portfolios, everyone's kind of stuffed into the U.S. And Americans are also historically underweight compared to emerging markets compared to how they have been in the past. So everyone's kind of really kind of stuffed into the U.S. And, you know, there's uh, I think there are good opportunities uh, in the U.S., especially among those things like energy pipelines and producers and things like that. But I, I think some of the other opportunities are more compelling. So I would generally when we start to see that reacceleration. I would be interested in things like Bitcoin. I'd be interested in things like emerging markets. I'd be interested in, in energy again. Uh, I'd be interested in copper again. Um, and some of those things, like I'm, like I said, I'm holding now. But I, I'd be more interested in even, you know, leading into those because now they'd have both the cyclical and the secular background support in them, rather than kind of that conflict between long-term bullish and near-term cautious. And big tech is conspicuously missing from your comments in the newsletter and even right now. Um, any specific reasons? So I think I think big tech is one of the areas that, that's really challenged. Um, not necessarily in terms of, well, some of them are challenged in terms of actual fundamentals, right? I mean, we see, for example, Meta is burning through a ton of cash uh, for uh, the metaverse, and we don't know what the, what the eventual payout rate uh, is going to be from all that investment. Other ones like, you know, Apple's holding up better. Uh, but if you look at Apple, you know, analysts expect something like 6% earnings growth the next three years. Uh, and it's trading at like, you know, last I checked, 25 times earnings. It's got significant exposure to China during a, a rising, you know, geopolitical challenging environment. And so, you know, generally when you look at the largest stock in the index uh, and, you, and you ask, how does that perform over the next 10 years? Usually the answer is not great. And sometimes it's because they were disrupted in some way, right? They, they failed to innovate, they were disrupted, uh, and they, they lost market share. Other times they did great, but their valuation was just too high. And so, you know, if, if, if Apple keeps growing, you know, it kind of hits stagnation in terms of smartphone penetration. And let's say it just kind of, you know, keeps mildly growing from here, but its valuation contracts, say, 25 times earnings to 18 times earnings over a multi-year period, you can have kind of a flattish stock price, uh, even though the fundamentals were fine, let alone if the fundamentals were disrupted in some way. Uh, and so I think a lot of the big tech companies are facing more headwinds than they used to. And that there, there are more, you know, some of them are more attractive than others, but I think that there are more compelling opportunities generally in the value uh, side, you know, as long as you're looking at, you know, not melting ice cubes, like, like you know, future proof types of things like energy pipelines, healthcare companies. There are There are things that have, growth or longevity to them uh, in the value side of things. And also some of these more cyclical markets, some of the more industrial markets, some of the, you know, energy has been a big underperformer for, for 10, 15 years. And of course, it's had a very strong year this year. Uh, but I think that there's probably a multi-year trend ahead of it, of it doing pretty well. And then when you get into like medium size or smaller tech, you know, that's, that's already, already had a big sell-off. So there's certainly interesting areas to look at there because that's, that's very out of favor at the moment. But one of the big challenges there was that there was some, some degree of malinvestment because you were based on the idea of super low energy prices, super low interest rates, uh, which allowed for super high equity valuations. You could pay employees with very expensive stock, and therefore you could have this kind of you know virtuous cycle of tech disinflation and you know just very long runway expectations. But now that you have a higher cost of capital, uh, and lower valuations, it, it's hard for some of those models to sustain themselves in, in the way they were. They have to raise prices uh, on their on their products and services, which generally then slows down their growth to some extent. So basically, we can say that s some degree of their pricing was likely artificial just in that environment. And so I think we're going to kind of see the, the wheat separate from the shaft there to find out, you know, what is what is obviously a useful product, even even when it's priced appropriately versus what only kind of made sense when it was when it was priced inappropriately. And I think that there's generally been overinvestment in that space, uh, whereas there's been underinvestment in things like chemicals companies, refineries, industrials, energy. These the, we, We've kind of spent a decade of very much investing in the digital 
And while I think the world's going to get more and more digital over time, I think we're due for a, a physical investment cycle. Very interesting. And I don't think it's really the kind of zeitgeist uh, right now. I was confused about infrastructure since governments are cash strapped. Don't you think infrastructure spending will be down this uh, decade? I think it depends where you look. I, I think that generally in these types of big kind of turning points in, in say, high debt, uh, high inflation situations, you know, there are some countries that can try to turn to austerity. But in many ways, that's what they've been doing for the past 10, 20 years. I mean, if you look at infrastructure spending in the United States, for example, it's, it's gone way down uh, until some of these recent bills uh, that, that put money for the longer term. Uh, Europe's kind of known for not very doing uh, much uh, infrastructure spending. And I think that some of these countries, they it's kind of like once you get past the, the event horizon where they kind of see that you know, the, the austerity is not going to work. They almost go in the other direction. They're like, well, let's let's do a trillion dollars in infrastructure. Let's, you know, so I think this is going to be an environment where it's very country specific. Uh, I think we're still going to see more infrastructure spending in a number of developing countries. And I also think that we're going to see targeted, at least targeted infrastructure spending in, you know, some of these more developed countries, uh, I, especially around energy. I mean, if you have just reoccurring problems, I think you're going to see more and more of that. Uh, and then, you know, one of the risks is that the government could interfere with, with say, private spending, right? So, for example, right now there's an energy shortage. Uh, you know, oil companies had a very rough, you know, call it 10 years. Uh, a lot of them went bankrupt back in 2015, 2016 after the oil price crash. Some of them went bankrupt again uh, or ones that didn't go bankrupt, you know, went bankrupt, bankrupt in 2020 when oil went, you know, negative for a period of time and then it was super low all year. So no one rushed in to help them then. But now that they're actually having pretty good margins, there's calls for windfall taxes and nationalization and things like that. So if you're if you're like a oil executive and you're and you're kind of looking at some of these longer term projects like offshore drilling or a big pipeline project, you now have to factor in the not just the risk of the underlying, you know, what's going to happen with the oil price, what's going to happen with this, what's going to happen with the cost of capital. You're also now saying, okay, well, what happens if if half my profits are capped? Right. So I have all the downside risk, but none, but, you know, potentially some of the upside risk is taken away. And so that can actually delay or, or prevent some of those supply uh, additions. So I, I think it's going to be very country specific. I think I think some countries are going to go in some directions where it ends up limiting the type of, of you know, kind of real world investment that can happen. Whereas I think other countries are going to kind of push it hard uh, and they're, and they're going to do what they call. And we already see some of this spending to reduce inflation. Right. That's how that's how it's going to be phrased, which is they're going to insist on the idea that it's a long term investment. And that that has some degree of merit if you're sure that what that the money being spent is going to be spent productively. Right. If you're actually going to reduce some some, some supply issues, then ironically, spending money can reduce inflation. The the I think the big challenge is actually doing it in such a way that it it does what it says it's going to do. And on a reasonable time frame. Do you think Bitcoin has bottomed? So I think there's a good chance it's bottomed. Uh, it's showing a number of signs that are that have been consistent with prior bottoms, right? So the for example, the market price is below the realized price, and the realized price is like the on-chain cost basis on average. Obviously, everybody has their own cost basis, but if you aggregate all the times like the la the coins last moved um, with with some adjustments for known entities and things like that, you know, there's companies like Glassnode that specialize in that type of analysis. And that market price is below the realized price, meaning the average on-chain Bitcoiner is slightly in the red. And, and normally that is a, a bottoming type of process. Now, there are still shocks, I can imagine, that give us another leg lower, right? So if, if the Fed stays super hawkish, if you get just the dollar just completely spikes, you know, dollar index soars to over 120, you know, the, I can imagine a, a lower low. Uh, it's certainly not out of the question. People should not invest in such a way that they are sure that the bottom is in. But I, I think we are starting to see higher and higher probability that the bottom is is a, you know, a good chance of being in. And the way I would phrase it is that you know while we still have a tight Fed, this goes back to my prior point about not trying to kind of call a pivot ahead of time and being defensive until you actually see tangible reversals. I think as long as you're in a declining PMI environment, strong dollar, Fed tightening, you have to be a little bit defensive here, uh, even on Bitcoin, and, and kind of just, you know, humble about you've, 
it's very hard to predict what's going to happen in a six month period with it. Um, but I think that it's it's already at a point where it's in what I would call a deep value zone. And so I think it's it's got a very high probability of having, say, uh, very good three year returns, even though I think the next six months are still quite questionable. So I think it's a good period for accumulation, dollar cost averaging, unlevered ownership. Um, but I'd be careful with anyone wanting to, to really push the risk on it. You have a model portfolio on your website. And on that, you have um, you have an allocation to the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust, I think, for your Bitcoin exposure. And you've allocated like 5%. I'm curious why Grayscale Bitcoin uh, Trust GBTC versus a Bitcoin ETF which trades at NAV? Any specific reasons? So in the United States, we unfortunately don't have a, a normal Bitcoin ETF yet, right? You have a, you have a futures one. Uh, you know, Canada has, has a good ETF. And that platform has some. You know, that platform I use for that portfolio has some limitations on what securities you can pick. Uh, and so I, I generally would recommend directly owning Bitcoin where possible. You know, uh, to personally own it. If that can't be done, I mean, if you're in a country where you have a spot ETF, I think that's that's a good product um, for like a brokerage exposure, right? So you have price exposure even if you don't have underlying exposure. Um, and then as you go from there, you have other options. One is the miners. I used to have a little bit of mining exposure, but I, I, I took that away a while ago, and I'm glad I did because we've seen a lot of turmoil in the, in the mining uh, sector. And so I've been focusing on GBTC as one of the ways to hold it. Now, it's both good and bad because you're, one is you're buying Bitcoin at a discount. Uh, it's over 30% discounted to NAV. The downside is there's no real catalyst for why that should go away anytime soon other than being allowed to one day convert to an ETF. So it's kind of like you're buying discounted Bitcoin with an extra call option on should that ever become an ETF, you know, you you close that gap when that happens. But on the other side of that, if it, if years go by, it's not allowed to convert to an ETF. There's no end in sight for you know it, it's its existence as that fund. There's nothing really preventing it from going to a negative forty or negative fifty percent discount to NAV. And so it doesn't provide that clean Bitcoin price exposure in a way that either a spot ETF would or preferably directly on Bitcoin would. So I definitely think that uh, people should directly buy Bitcoin and self-custody it. But if they are, for whatever reason, in a, in a kind of walled guard environment where they want Bitcoin exposure, but they have limited options, I, I think Grayscale is one of the options. I'd just be more cautious with position sizing with that than I would be with Bitcoin itself. Yeah, I think the Canadian ETF is called Purpose Invest or Prosper Invest, I'm not really sure, but one of them, yeah. Purpose, yeah, yeah. Purpose, Purpose Invest, yeah. I think there are a lot more ETFs now uh, listed out of Canada, but I'm, I'm not really sure about that. Any other macro trends you are seeing which uh, maybe is being missed by the mainstream media? I think the, so a lot of things that I was following a couple of years ago that it would be considered missed, uh, like what was happening in energy, for example, are now being covered quite heavily. But I think what's still being missed is some of the underlying reasons or duration of some of these things, right? So when people look at energy markets, they often think of, of Putin's war, for example. And while that was a variable, the under, an underlying issue is a, a lack of capex and, and a lack of kind of marginal new supply that can come onto the market. We don't really have, you know, the whole last decade, we had, we had U.S. shale just constantly ramping up and bringing new supply to the global market. And that's not really happening anymore. Uh, we've kind of already tapped, we already got the low hanging fruit from that new technology in that region. And so I think going forward, we have ongoing questions about where are we going to get abundant, cheap energy? And, you know, I think we're in an environment where We've seen the inflation spike, and then in many countries, we're starting to see disinflation, right? With central bank tightening, with you know strong dollar, uh, you know we're starting to see some of that disinflationary pressures. And I think a lot of people assume that once that goes down, it's just behind us now. And that's like that's that was a story that happened. Whereas I think an issue is that that, that inflation is ready to return. Should, for example, the Fed uh, eventually pivot or get dovish in some way, basically, there's as long as they stop holding down demand. Like as long as the supply side's unaddressed, it's ready to come right back. And I think that some of the inflation we saw was was say COVID specific. People rapidly changed their demand profile, right? Because if you were locked at home, you stopped buying certain uh, services, you you bought more products, uh, goods, and then as things opened up, you kind of went back to a more normal consumption pattern. 
Um, and so some of that was was temporary disruptions. But I think that I think the longer term underlying inflationary variable to watch is is basically oil and gas and nuclear capex, uh, basically base load energy capex. Uh, and I think that that's still going to be a longer term inflationary pressure. And I don't think the media's or financial media or investors in general are kind of fully appreciating some of the, the risks and pressures there. In your investment opportunities, you've mentioned Bitcoin and not crypto. Are you a Bitcoin maximalist? I think basically, I mean, if someone, you know, is on a, focuses on, on a board that's Bitcoin only and, and does uh, Bitcoin only VC investing, I'm certainly in the, in the, in the Bitcoin maximalist camp. I, you know, I, I cover some other projects because, you know, I have generally not very favorably, but I still cover them. Uh, and that's because, you know, people want, people want to explore what's happening in the ecosystem. And sometimes to better understand Bitcoin, you have to understand things like Ethereum, right? So sometimes understanding something means understanding its opposite. And then, and then you can explain the differences, right? So I do cover some other digital assets. I keep, I keep trends of what's happening in that broader space. The problem is that when I look out through most of that space, I see... You know, at best, I see interesting ideas, but then the, the 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 problem I would phrase it is that a lot of people are trying to get undeserved seniorage, right? So, for example, if you do a startup, you know, you you have to, you know, you build a team. VCs and founders are basically locking in capital and time for a very long period of time until either they get an acquisition or they go public. You know, some sort of event that they proved that their underlying product or service was, you know, sustainably in demand and that they build a good company and then it, get, it gets, you know, uh, some sort of exit. Whereas what you see in the crypto space is they build these projects. Their, you know, demand is mostly there due to a gambling component rather than actual underlying use of whatever it is that they build it, it, other than uh, aside from that speculation. And then you have VCs and founders dumping their tokens onto retail investors pretty early on that timeline of their project before it has any sort of sustainable, you know, oof to it. It's, it's basically just, you know, kind of various types of pump and dumps. And so I, I think generally most, the vast majority of the crypto space has been unattractive from that point. The, the one exception I've made is for stable coins. I think stable coins are a very useful technology. Uh, they actually originated on Bitcoin. Uh, they've since migrated to a, a bunch of different platforms. There's some developers out there that have have ideas to bring some of that back to Bitcoin, you know, by using it with the Lightning Network and things like that. But I think that that stable coins are, especially for a lot of people in countries where they have rampant inflation. There's a history if they put dollars in their local bank, they just get confiscated or you know converted back to the local currency at an unfavorable exchange rate. And so they want to hold dollars in an entity that is outside of their country. And so they can kind of do that peer-to-peer uh, and, and have that centralized hub be somewhere else. So I think that there's value in stable coins. Uh, and it doesn't really matter too much what blockchain that's on because a stable coin is centralized anyway. But outside of Bitcoin and stable coins, I think there's a, a very high hurdle for these things to prove themselves. And, and I think a lot of it is, is kind of undeserved seniorage. You must be getting a lot of questions, at least on Ethereum. I mean, normally a person who's new to investing in crypto, at least at the minimum ends up buying Bitcoin and Ethereum together. You said that Ethereum, according to you, is the exact opposite of Bitcoin. I mean, when you try and understand these cryptos, why do you not favor Ethereum? Is there any specific reason? Mainly because I view it as more centralized, right? So the, the, the kind of the key insight of Bitcoin, what makes it interesting, the combination of small blocks, so you have basically easy to run nodes and proof of work is the best way we know how to decentralize a, a blockchain. And, you know, Bitcoin, for example, was, was also tested quite well. It got through the block size war where, you know, most of the mining hash rate, most of the major exchanges you know, big players in the industry wanted to, ch- to change Bitcoin. They wanted to increase the block size. It would have made nodes harder to run uh, at the cost, you know, at the benefit of more scaling. And they were unable to get that change through because of the u- the user nodes uh, and the ability to run a node and kind of the pushback uh, against that. And so it, it kind of was the one crypto that really got through an actual, you know, test of decentralization. Whereas Ethereum, you know, it spent the first seven years of its life with a difficulty bomb in it, 
So that basically gives developers more control rather than miners or users. You know, that basically gives developers the, op the opportunity to push updates essentially onto the network. Whereas in Bitcoin, updates can only be pulled. Developers can propose updates, but you know, node runners don't have to update. Um, and so that's been a very opposite design in Ethereum that basically does, in, in Bitcoin, it starts out as a mostly finished product. And then it's this very slow, purposely difficult pro process to upgrade it because it, it gives most of the power to the users. Whereas in Ethereum, you do that developer focused top down model of, of kind of, you know, having a roadmap and pushing changes through. And then even now that they've switched to proof of stake. And so the, the difficulty bombs out, they still haven't allowed withdrawing yet so, so if you stake your coins you have to ask developers when you can unstake and there's still like you know developers have a very specific roadmap in mind of updates they're going to try to push through it's harder to run a node because of just higher bandwidth and complexity we also see some concerns around uh centralization of block construction due to uh you know MEV, which it gets pretty technical, but essentially there's there's reasons to, in Ethereum to outsource block construction to a handful of, of specialized providers, which are currently censoring transactions. Uh, they're OFAC compliant. And so, you know, I, I'd also separate, you know, when I talk about Ethereum, I also separate price and fundamentals. So if someone has a fundamental concern with something and they were always bearish on price because of that reason, and then the price went up, that person would obviously lose, lose some degree of credibility. Um, so what I what I do if I'm analyzing whether it's a company or whether it's a crypto, I'll say my fundamental concerns. But sometimes the price does its own thing. So for example, right now I, I think you know Ethereum has engineered a pretty good supply squeeze where where you know they've they've essentially eliminated issuance. Uh, they have not allowed staking withdrawals, and so a pretty small amount of demand can send the price up pretty far. So I think for example, objectively, the ETH BTC ratio looks pretty intermediate term bullish to me that's that's purely a price observation whereas I, I think most of my concerns are that at deeper longer term fundamental level of you know what is ethereum's long-term purpose what what problems is it actually solving in this world compared to what bitcoin's solving and so it's something that i i research ethereum i i learn from it i contrast it with bitcoin but it's something i i've not felt compelled that i want to basically put capital into very interesting way to frame this. Uh, Lynn, you're a sought after resource at Bitcoin events. Any favorite events you've been to that you recommend? And I'm sure you must be going to Corey's uh, Pacific Bitcoin event. Uh, I think it's happening this week, right? Yeah, I'm definitely um, uh, I'm going to the first annual uh, Pacific Bitcoin conference uh, that's that's being put on by the SWAN team. Um, so I, obviously, I've it's our first one. So I'll, I'll tell you how it is after I've, I've been there, but I expect it to be awesome. I, I think actually my favorite event was was not a Bitcoin event. It was the Oslo Freedom Forum, which is which is hosted by the Human Rights Foundation, and but they had a Bitcoin component to it because you know they use Bitcoin as a tool for human rights. So they're not a Bitcoin organization, but they they are quite interested in Bitcoin and stable coins because they you know they view financial freedom as one of the types of freedoms that they have to enforce around the world. So for example, if, if someone's a journalist in a country uh, and they're critical of the government there, and then therefore their bank accounts are getting frozen, you know, they're having all these difficulties, you know, receiving, receiving payments and things like that. Um, the Human Rights Foundation can come in and say, well, look, here, here are some tools you can use if you're being debanked or you're being censored in some way. Here, here are these op more open options. Uh, and so, you know, just like, you know, other tools that they would use, Bitcoin is one of the tools that they use. And so I, I had the privilege of going there and speaking uh, about some of that uh, and, and basically meeting with, with human rights activists and trying to understand what their needs are. And so I think that that one has a somewhat special place to me because it's not, you know, a, you know, a lot of conferences, I, I love the conferences, but like, you know, you'll have like, um, you know, bullish Bitcoiners talking to other bullish Bitcoiners, why we're all bullish. And it's fun. And, and, you know, especially the, the tech panels that they do with those, I think are really valuable. That's where you learn about a lot of the new tech that's happening, which, which gets less airtime. Uh, so I, I think conferences are super valuable. But for me, it, it's the things that actually have that, that meaning behind them. Like, what is kind of the end goal of all this? What is the real world application for this outside of number go up? And so I think that's the, the Oslo Freedom Forum is pretty cool. Yeah, your presence uh, at that conference at the Oslo Freedom Conf Forum was I think really covered uh, well 
um, by the Bitcoin uh, media. And I was following all your engagements over there. That was really interesting. A couple of things that I want to mention to the listeners is I think on your website, you've mentioned that your favorite book is the most important thing by Harvard Marx. Uh, anything that comes to the top of your mind from that book and it's applicable to Bitcoin? I would say, what, what, so that's a short read and it's not a complex read. And what makes it so good is that it's, it's applicable for no matter what investing you do, right? So Howard Marks is a billionaire uh, bond investor, but the book's not about bonds at all. It, it's basically, it could be stocks, it could be bonds, it could be Bitcoin, it could be startups. Uh, it is basically a, a psychology of investing book and, you know, avoiding traps. And the joke behind the book is that Howard uh, often finds, and I, I, had, I had the opportunity to meet him once. I, basically, he's, he's, you know, he's an, he's an amazing investor. And he has a habit of saying, like, uh, you know, the most important thing. And, and then, like, a few minutes later, he'll say, you know, the most important thing. And it's, like, a different thing. And so he wrote a book where every chapter is, like, the most important thing. And it's a different lesson. So that's kind of the joke of the book. But essentially, it's, you know, it's a dozen or a dozen and a half. I forget how many chapters. But it's, it's, it's a bunch of different ind- independent short lessons that are generally about, you know, smart, smart investing, investing psychology, uh, managing yourself knowing what traps to avoid. So I think it's it's kind of like my go-to first recommendation if someone wants to learn more about investing. I think while I was going through your website, there's also a fantastic article that you've written on health. I think it's called Increasing Energy Levels or something like that. I'll paste a link to that article in the show notes below. Before we wrap up, how can people find you, Lynn, and your advisory services? Uh, so I'm at lynnlawton.com. People can find me there, um, or they can see my free content, or they can sign up. I'm also active on Twitter at Lynn on Contact. Uh, so thanks, thanks for having me. This was fun. Lynn, it's been a privilege. Thank you for doing this, and thank you for coming on 21 Towers.